I was just waiting for the last uh, co-presenter, but I guess we can start with that. How do you turn on the timer? I think guess we can just start. I was waiting for a Said. <coughs> so yeah, the microphone is on, right? Yeah, so this is the network performance workshop. So the background for the workshop is that I'll, I'll give a status about, I cannot stand here, get this light in my head. I'll go over here. Uh, I'll get a status of the progress we've just done, but I'm actually, actually most, mostly focused on all the stuff we didn't do yet. Because uh, that's, that's what it's, it's all about, all, all the stuff we have to fix. Um, so I'll talk about all of the sort of existing bottlenecks in the kernel and some ideas to what direction we should go. And I highly encourage people like discuss that all of my ideas are stupid or something. I'm very much up to <laughs> to discussing that. Uh, so so it's it's also a time to come up with good good ideas, new ideas. Maybe just bad ideas, that's also okay. Well, first I want to give a, like, a shout out to, to all of the, the many con contributors. This is not, that's also why I wanted to do a, a workshop, not just that I'm talking about network performance. There's actually a lot of contributors helping addressing these issues. Uh, foremost, Alexander Dyke, who's just here, which did a lot of the optimization for the, for the FIP, FIP lookup, which was really great, basically, Double the performance uh, of the kernel uh, routing uh, lookup, and we also have have done some things like the, the page track. And Eric Dumasi was also involved in that. We moved that into the memory area, which is great. And Alex also did a lot of small optimizations all over the place, but they they all add up. And David also did a lot of things, but it's, we finally pushed through the the XMIT more, and we have seen a lot of action going around this and there's a huge improvement. And also for, for, for being the most efficient maintainer, because now I actually had to, to work with the, the memory people and, 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 and took that pain of how, how slowly it is to get my patches in there. So I was really happy when I came back. Of the, I almost spent a year in, in, in the memory allocator. Uh, then, then, then you realize how, how, how good a maintainer we have in, in, in the networking area. And how efficient. Yes? And then I also want to thank like Herbert and Alexia and Brendan who, who started this XDP stuff, which David just said was the most greatest thing ever. <laughs> I'm really happy to hear that. So that they also started that was one of my really crazy ideas uh, since the last last workshop, and that they've won that one. I think it was called the the page. Uh, the packet page, I call it the packet page uh, uh, idea. Yeah. And John Fasterband, I put him on stage because he's doing so much great work in the, in the Q-Disk area, which I've been pitching about for two years or something, and he's actually fixing it. So I'm really happy about that. And, and Mellonox for being the, 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 the first driver that actually like, took, took the XTP idea. We had jumped the board and said, okay, we are going to do this. That's, that's, that's really great. And Florian, he also does optimizations within, the, within the, 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 the NetFilter area. Even though I want a super hot path, it's actually NetFilter is using, used everywhere. So optimization in that area is also very valuable. We, should, we shouldn't forget that. And then Hannes and Paolo are doing some really interesting work within the, the how, how we interact with the scheduler. Uh, and that's actually... I'm really scared of jumping into that because like last time I jumped into something like that, it cost me a full year in the memory allocator. And now I hope that Hannes will jump in the, in the, in the scheduler area I, I, so I don't have to jump in there. Uh, and, and we have, have all the, the reviews going on on, on, on NetDev. So it's, it's really a joint effort of many people to, to getting this, this working. So, so the this, this status is like approximately two years, I think. Like, I would say that I've been working on the lowest layers, or we've been working on the lowest layers 
So the transmit layer, when we started out, it was quite disappointing that we had just ran some, some like benchmark and tried to cut out, just do the lowest layer transmit, and the kernel could only do four million packets per second. It's like, oh, what's going on? And that's the, the whole discovery of XMIT more than that it was expensive calling the hardware, writing the tail point or the ringing the doorbell down with the, the driver. That was sort of a revolution. So that was where all the XMIT more stuff came in. And I would say we basically solved that transmit area. Like we can do a single call, full 10 gig wire speed. So then we, uh, we have the lowest receive layer. And when, when last year, uh, I started looking at that. I think this number from the Mellanox driver that I was also disappointed because we only have six million packets per second, just receiving in the driver and dropping it. That's not, well, that's not good enough. So, but I think actually today I would say if you do the same kind of test, basically, I think for the same driver it was like 16 million packets per second, um, and we have like XTP drop. Uh, for the MLX4, which is actually like 20 million packets per second. So that's, I'll talk a little bit more about XTP later. But you shouldn't, like, this is like forgetting that the whole stack exists, right? So we're just fixing the lowest layer. So, but we, we have to like do IP forwarding. We actually like doubled the performance for a single call. Like to, before we did like 1 million packets per second, and now we're doing 2 million packets per second. And actually, I would actually say most of the, that work comes from uh, Alex's uh, optimizations. And, and then we also, so, and the problem was mostly actually we didn't scale that well and we, did, we also did some things there. So now we actually scale up, we have multi-core to 12 million packets per second. This, I, took, I took, just took uh, Alex's benchmark from a, a rail kernel. We backported this stuff too. Um, and, and a single core with XTP we can bounce, I'm, I'm saying 10 million packets per second. I think Tom is saying 14 or something, or just hardware dependent. So I think we think we have, we're doing really good progress. This is just from the last net, net dev, which was in was in February. For, so for, 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 no, no, this was not this. This was the XTP. This was actually like two years of work, years of work. Uh, so <clears throat> I also want to explain at least why I've been focused on on sort of the lowest layer. It's been provoked quite a lot with the the DBDK work going on. Um, so that's have sort of made me focus on like I said the transmit bottleneck is basically solved and and we are working on the bottleneck in the receive path and I've noticed a lot of issues with the uh, memory allocators so I've I think Eric will have, have some sometimes on this complained a little bit but it's actually on purpose I've been testing and avoiding the socket layer because there's a lot of work to do there and that's what I talked about Hannes and Paolo are actually looking into that now uh, you can say something about it if you want. Okay. Um, so turn on the mic. Hello. Okay. Um, so, so one, a few things we, we currently look into is like the first of all is we want to remove the um, backlog. So currently the situation is like if UDP receives a packet, but if you have like the socket locked from user space, we actually include in a in a per socket structure and later on if the socket is like unlocked we call back and, and basically process the UDP packet until it receives gets into the SK receive queue. Um, so one the reason why this is done is that we have some operations in regard to forward memory allocation um, that require the socket lock um, at that moment. So the idea is to, to somehow fiddle around with like um, atomic variables instead of taking the full socket lock. So we have a lockless pass in while enqueuing the UDP packets, which which shows like great significant um, performance improvements. Um, as soon as we we kind of figure out how to safely do that, so the the problem is like we have like a temporal. Um, there's a Updating the atomic variables is there are multiple atomic variables, so we could now have the problem that we we have temporal over allocation or under allocation in the forward path. So we need to find a way to keep this minimal, so so there is no like um, over allocation or too much over allocation or under allocation in the in forward malloc. Um, and after that, our plan is to to actually 
do UDP vectors, so doing GRO on UDP, so that we can basically, we, we, we check that the UDP header is exactly the same on receiving fragments, uh, on received um, frames, so we can basically get all those SKBs together, push them through the routing engine, and um, the current patch I last reviewed was like, right before we actually put it into the socket, we actually decapsulate or we just break the, the queue into um, normal SKBs, so basically the UDP receive um, message logic basically sees the SKBs like they would have been um, enqueued without this feature. And we are like right now looking, at, uh, look, looking into if we can just expand it to have like uh, the normal GRO, GSO symmetrical approach that we can um, accumulate those packets and have a proper GSO function to send them out. And the idea is to actually expand it up until vidIO so we have like good UDP throughput for connected sockets in the moment of our sockets where we actually match the, um, the header um, up until virtual machines. Yeah. And um, the third part would then be to revisit also the receive M message functions and send M message functions, which are right now in a bit of a sorry state because like we we actually they just loop around the receive message stuff in, inside the kernel and we don't actually like go into the socket, take the socket lock once and DQ or NQ multiple or send out multiple frames at once. So yeah, those three steps yeah, for exactly. UDP are right now um, what we are looking into. I, I have high hopes for that that work actually. Also, like the we have the the, the user space calls to do the multiple receives of UDP packets as, as you talked about, we, but we are not really not taking advantage of it. So unverified benchmarks currently show an increase from 500 to 500,000 packets per second to 2.5 million packets per second. Yeah, <laughs> that's like really significant. So one of my and I want to stress this is like one of my long-term targets, which also related a bit to the to the socket layer. That I actually want to to, to start works towards what Van Jacobsen called the net channels. That, like today, we're just spreading these 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 flows across the different queues, and this this requires this heavy locking that Hannes is also talking about. And so I want I really want to create some kind of channel isolation directly from the NIC to the application. So it's, it's, it's really advanced stuff, and we have there's m multiple steps along the way before we can actually do this. And we would need to cooperate with the NIC hardware filters, which is really annoying now because it's not expressed in a uniform way. You, there's no like API to it. You just call user space ECH yeah, to maybe use XDP. <laughs> you can use XDP for. Yeah, you could use XDP. So, but that that the X, using X, XDP for this would be like a a, a, a DMOX step in in in. Uh, in, in software, but it would give us some of the performance. I want to push it like all the way to to hardware, so I know when I get delivered something yeah. on a specific hardware queue. As far as I understand it, you have, you, I think you told me that you, or some of some hardware guy told me you, you can easily create a lot of queues in the hardware. There's, there's, right. there's no really limits about that. So. Right. <coughs> so if people don't understand the. The Mike Jacobson's idea is basically built, built upon the like single producer and single consumer scheme. So Mike Jacobson said there's also a, there's always a relationship with like uh, a producer and a, and a consumer. So why don't we take advantage of this in, in the network protocols? Because if we can just sort of pair them up, it's the current kernel approach. We try, we just use the RSS hash and spread it out and because. It's sort of a best effort. We don't have any strict requirements on this. It, it, even though we, when we configure it and set it up, it's, that's how we recommend users are doing it. And we, we, try, to keep, we try to keep the flows on, on the same CPUs. And, but in practice, it can, it, 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 they, they, they can jump around if it gets rehashed or something in the hardware or something going on. So we need the lock anyway. So we can't really remove these locks. So I've got a question. No. The, what's the point again? You, you want to process TCP in user space? No, no, okay. no, 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 no. I want to create a, a complete uh, connection with all the way from the NIC. Basically, it's sort of what David uh, wants, which is the sockets. And I, the next, I think the next slide is, is about how, how, how you do this for the sockets. So you, the, the socket queue is going to be in the NIC? Yeah, basically. So I'll create a, a new 
new uh, receive queue for, for every socket I want. Uh, how many socket queues can you have? I think uh, the limit is probably 100,000 max, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but what the hard drive has I, told I, me that there's I think a, a limit. There has to be a limit. Yeah, th there is a limit, but for, uh, as we said, it's, uh, it's configurable for uh, Connectix 3, 4, and 5 cards. Uh, you can have up to millions. Um, Mi millions? Yeah. Yeah, but in, in practice, you, if you wanted to scale out your application out to millions, you, you likely would like some kind of not do some multiplexing or, or not create a million if you have a lot of small flows. This, this might not be the solution you want because they were too short lived. Uh, so, well, the, the, the practical details, but how you would do it, and this is like the long term plan. So, if there was existed like, like a hardware filter system, I could just like unlisten or bind, uh, call the hardware filter, make it deliver into a specific receive queue, and, and all of a sudden I have this, uh, this binding of, for the listener socket. Of, I have a single, I know it can only. Rec a, occur on one receive queue and I, I know there's only one listener so I, it's completely lock free and single producer, single consumer but I need some hardware guarantees there. So the, the more uh, difficult part is once you get the accept call you would you would like get back a, a channel which is a new uh, producer consumer queue and you could like ask the hardware to, to process that on another receive queue, which would be on another uh, another like process by another CPU. So it's the, the the tricky part is or the difficult part for the hardware is updating the update speeds. I can do this in. I don't want to. It it, it can slow down. So I, I can I can I can sort of block the the packets in the hardware until the hardware filter is updated. That's one approach, but that slows down the hook if we want to establish connections. Um, so, so there's there's a lot of like uncertainty in this area. Uh, Don't you? But you must make sure that basically the transmit is going with out of the same core. The transmit. This is only on the receive side. But if you, I, I understand it like that you actually want to keep like everything in in one. Um, on one CPU, so you want to basically create like um, per CPU network stacks. Yes. Exactly, but for that to not but have interlocking on the sending side, because sending side needs to update also counters and stuff like that, you actually need to um, keep the sending side also on the same, so you need to like, I don't know, create some hashing scheme or like fiddle around with the RSS key, so it actually creates symmetric keys. Yeah, yeah, you had, yeah, but I, I think, I believe Google are doing stuff like that with um, calculating as is key. Jesper, how is this different from accelerated RFS or flow director? How's, how's different? How's, how's it different from accelerated RFS? Like, trying to yeah, do the, the, kind of the same yeah, thing. The accelerated RFS, uh, it's, it's basically the same, right? Uh, so. so this is doing the same thing. I'm, so I'm confused. Why do we need this then? I, I, I don't, it's not doing the same thing because with accelerated RPS we could, I guess we could, we, could, we could then add some hooks that says this, we know this connection, so, so don't use the socket locks, use another uh, construct to have the, the queue for the socket. That's, I don't think we do that today, do we? I'm trying to remove the locks. So, so I understand that. So in order to do that, I think what we're basically saying is packets for a flow will only go to a, a specific CPU yeah. guaranteed and then we can remove the lock from that. Yeah. I think you could do that without um, without needing exactly what you want here. I, I think the issue here is um, something that's not an accelerated RFS. The question is if I program a filter in, in hardware and I say this precise flow, this precise TCP connection has to go to this um, CPU. Well, well, it's not only CPU, it's for its, its own queue. Um, it's, its own queue. So let's assume that. But then I ask myself, what if I have an encapsulated connection? Then my device has to be able to parse all of these, um, all of these different encapsulations. Because the difference here with accelerated RFS is we're not just saying this, uh, it's good enough to have a strong hash. Uh, with very few hash collisions. The difference here is we're saying the hardware has to be very precise and pick the exact TCP connections on that. And I, th I think that's going to be a, a, 
a, a big gap to actually get to the hardware to that point, especially with all the encapsulations that are happening. Yeah, I'm also a little bit afraid of what guarantees the hardware can give me. Uh, another question is, what if you have a, what, what if what if you call a listener bind it sets up your channel, and then somebody configures an IP tables rule that drops that packet or mangles it? What happens yeah. then, right? You gonna run the net filter hooks? No. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I, I think you would you would have to opt into this like a socket opt and say I want this. Uh, I say it's I a, you, have to, be, you have to be you have to be capped. I just want, this has been a fundamental issue with net channels from the very beginning. When Van gave his first talk in New Zealand, it's the first thing out of Rusty Russell in my mouth was, well, now no more net filter is going to be happening if you pass this stuff straight to the stack. So. Yeah, but it's, it's sort of the same problem. Oh, did, wait, there's, there's another way to look at this. <clears throat> so the, you could also say that the same problem kind of exists for socket pre Does it, though? We, have, yeah. we actually have problems like that. The routing table can actually like have IP rules, for example, which don't get like consulted. Yeah, yeah. In so, so the, 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 the premise is once we've established the connection, started to move data past it, and set up that pre-demux configuration, we've legitimized that path, and we no longer need to do net filter stuff on it anymore. But you may want to change the, the path later and start dropping packets in the middle of a session. So, anyways. Uh, yes. David, I think we, we still we we just still do the socket lookup, we do the DST entry, but we still we don't the running look up, we still do the net filter yeah. stuff. But this is taking it one step further and eliminating layers altogether. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it is a radical idea. And it and I said to <laughs> start with this is not going to be tomorrow. <laughs> this is I, really difficult. I got a more fundamental question. So if you're running as a server, you have multiple NICs, how does this work? Every you're gonna have pass socket queue on every NIC? Yeah, you, got, you, you have to do that. We have to have this relationship with the queue. There's a single person. What? The same socket. Uh, so you, you're, you're basically moving the socket queue into the NIC, correct? Yeah, basically. And so if I have 10 NICs on a server, I will have 10 socket queues on each one on each NIC. No, only one NIC is receiving traffic for a particular socket. It depends on the volume, oh. maybe. Well, if you have that kind of flapping routes, then. This this is not for you. Yeah, this is not. I, I you, we definitely need like, like you need to set uh, very explicitly. I want this feature, uh, this uh, socket up or whatever. Uh, that that and like we also pass, bypass the net filter stuff and there's, there's a lot of implications going on. Just as people can explicitly not configure any net filter rules, people can explicitly say I want these cues to go straight from the device into the, the socket. I mean, if you have the ability to change Why? the IP tables rule yourself, right. then you might as well do this, right? If it's um, permissions changed. But, but I think actually that, that the multi-card setup could make to work if the hashing is consistent over all hardware devices and if the RSS key is like synchronized between all of them, it could That's actually... a big if. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it could... Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's why we're afraid of doing it, right? Yeah. That's the if, if it all of a sudden goes out of sync. Yeah, that does. But it could also be like done optimistically, and we we actually check the RSS hash or the hash actually, and we can disable this feature in the stack as soon as we see like one network card is not cooperating. So, for example. Yeah, I was also considering stuff like that, but that's it's difficult to to do without the hard the the, the performance penalty you the check costs right. Uh, yeah. How is this different than RDMA? I'm just asking because the only difference between what you just described there and, and what an RDMA NIC does is that the, the RDMA NIC is able to, it has a stack of its own. But if you're bypassing the whole stack anyway, why wouldn't you just bother, just forget it and just use the RDMA capability of the NIC? This isn't data placement. This, this, this is past stack execution. You don't have the, to do the data this, placement. This the kernel is, can provide the data buffers. Uh, this, this doesn't, I actually think it's the next slide you're, you're going to complain about. <laughs> Am I jumping ahead uh, again? Yeah, no, that's, so, so in, in that slide I would say, yes, maybe you're right there, but not, not, not in, the, in, in, in about the sockets, because the sockets, I want to stay in the sockets. Once I go here, uh, when I want to stay in the socket, and I'm going, I'm going to use like data provided by backing pages for some, from, from something that not, might not be the from directly from the socket, and it, the RDMA gives me, I can give the pages, so there's something with, with the memory allocation with RDMA, I'm not too familiar with that. 
But the other, the, the more easy thing we could do would, would be like channelizing a raw socket and using XTP for that. So I could, I could say I want a TCP dump uh, and I want a filter for, for TCP dump and that filter for TCP dump, if I, if I just have the premise I can, I can steal the packet, that a, a filter for TCP dump is actually a, a, a EPPF filter. So I could just load that as uh, my HTTP filter. And if I bind it, if I bind it, if I have the hardware filter promising I put it into a, a, a specific receive queue, I can achieve, achieve this, this, the single producer part. I, don't, I wouldn't need to lock that part when I put it in. And if user space can promise that it will only run and, and putting packets out from a single, single a, a, a single process, I could sort of create like a, a, a TCP dump channel uh, uh, interface. It's also sort of a radical idea. As long as you only ever run one at a time. Yeah, I have to only <laughs> No, I can, I can run more. It's not a problem that I can have run. Yeah, so just thinking about it, essentially, so you keep calling it single producer setup. That single producer could be multiplexed over multiple of your socket channels, couldn't it? No, I don't. This 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 is from the receive side on, on the NIC. So I well, right. bind into uh, well, for example, one queue. for example, if you took received packet steering and enabled it on your one queue, so that one queue then had its traffic multiplexed to multiple CPUs. Then in that case, you'd have one queue feeding maybe eight CPUs, and you could be okay. I hand this one to this socket via a lockless ring. I hand one to this socket via a lockless ring. So on and so forth. They could basically span the whole set of CPUs with just RPS doing the uh, distribution instead of RSS. So you could actually get away with one ring feeding multiple sockets, which would help to reduce the total ring count needed, theoretically. So the receive, wouldn't that be a problem for the receive? I, 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 I've looked at I, I, I can support I can, there's the NAPI schedule which makes me support that it's okay even though when you have like one receive ring, a, a queue number, this queue number we can we actually have the SMP affinity stuff so it can actually jump between different CPUs. So I thought, oh, this is going to be a problem, but the NAPI schedule actually protects us from, from the... Well, RPS does the same thing. Because RPS will say, okay, I received this packet on CPU zero. Microphone. RPS gives you the same kind of protection because it'll be, okay, I received this packet on CPU zero. Yeah, he goes to CPU five now and can go be processed over there in that backlog. Yeah. So it essentially just becomes, you know, that was kind of the whole point of RPS, to take a single queue and be able to treat it like multiple queues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but then, then I would have this demoxing step like in RPS. If I just, in my raw package, I, I don't need to allocate or anything. I'll just take whatever comes in on this receive ring and pump it directly into right. a, a, a queue. So do you want to copy it? Because one of the, like the reason they have packet, like even packet RX steering is slow, is that it has can to copy it. Oh, sorry. So, so I guess the question is, do you, are you going to like, is, does XTP dump mean this channel is going to get this packet? Nobody else is ever going to see it. Because yeah, you, you saw, you, that's, that's the sort of, a, we, we, we can still change, change, change that option for, for, for uh, XTP, right? But for now, the model is a little bit that we don't allow sharing of these pages for XTP. No, but like you, you mentioned AF packet, right? One of the, AF packet yeah. is slow because it's a copy. Because it um, can't steal I, stuff, actually right? Actually, no. I actually benchmarked it. it it's 15%. It's, it's so if, if you benchmark it and you benchmark it naively, you will think it's uh, like 30%. But it's actually the cache mesh which is the problem. Um, I've written code that switched from packet read and to packet RX ring, and it didn't get any faster. Which version of packet RX? V, uh, V3 was like 5% better, but V2, uh, but it was pretty much the same. So I guess then the reason, like if you look at the packet socket handler, it makes a copy. It runs a BPF program on the original packet because it yeah. doesn't want to waste its time. Yeah. And it says, oh, you've got a packet socket. Here you are. Here's a copy. But if you could steal it, right? But yeah. that, that's how you like basically trade off semantics with speed. But you yeah. can have both, I think, because you do have to make a copy if you hand it to two sockets. Yeah, in, in or two sockets. In two sockets, we had, uh, yeah, but that's also why I have version version one. The first iteration of the user copy, right? The second we could do zero copy, and two. But that's that 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 requires some work in in the memory area, which I'm actually doing. So. 
So that's so. I want to, so I want to, want, want to change the topic unless there's more questions within the first area. <coughs> so this is quite a big, big thing to receive bottleneck, and it's it was a little bit larger than I first imagined, uh, because it's actually the multiple things I have to solve. With the transmit side, we figuring out this this. We did a lot of small optimizations, but the big thing was figuring out the XMIT more and the tail pointer and ringing the doorbell. That's wow! Now we, we get super fast speed, but the receive path there's multiple things I have to fix. So there's the latency when the, the first uh, so I, I have to do some latency because we have a cache mess when we read the first packet. There's ha some hardware support to help help that. So and I, I also want to do some in change how, how the, the, the receive driver, down, all the way down the driver, how we, we are not taking advantage of bulking or what I call stages. And we have some error in the MM bulk, allog and free APIs we have to address. And actually, this, this, that's actually processing stage. Basically, that's iCache optimization. It's, it's basically related to this ring buffer stuff here. If we um, interpret all code in eBPF, um, the code would actually only be data and not iCache. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, so I think several people had difficulty understanding this RX stages. So I'll, I'll sort of go through it. What I what I mean by these receive stages. Uh, so it's sort of an instruction cache uh, optimization, and you should see that's like working on a vector of packets. That's Sort of in the lowest layer of the, of the, of the receive stack. Um, so what I'm saying is that the drivers have missed opportunities. We already have receive bugging, but we don't take advantage of it. The drivers today will just take one packet after the receive ring and call, do all the things it has to do with it, and call them the the, the the full network stack. When it comes back, as 100% that it is have, have flushed the instruction cache and have to even have to reload the instruction cache of the drivers themselves. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities we can we can take here. Um, we stall on cache misses because we want to read the packet. The first thing we do is need to read the head of the packet, figure out what kind of ether type it is, uh, and we don't have any knowledge of how many packets are ready. So, so my claim is that well, if the receive ring contains multiple ready packets, that means, that can only mean that the kernel was too slow processing these packets. So we're in a state where or there's a really small microburst, but that's also okay. Uh, so what we should do is switch into a more efficient mode. So I don't know if people see this as a controversial idea. So we stop seeing this as individual packets in the receiver ring and, and instead see it as a vector of packets that we, we need to process in, as a whole uh, in the driver. There's not too many people objecting. That's good. Uh, yeah, uh, let me add something here that um, th there are three basic stages when uh, yeah. uh, the device driver receiver. I, I actually have this. Yeah, okay, so. For all this, the stages. Yeah. Um, so you can see, say if you agree with them. <laughs> I, I agree, and I agree with this optimization. I think uh, um, Intel guys here. Uh, would, um, uh, I, the, the basic idea here is to, um, to, to to split those stages and do do them all, all at once for all the packets that are already in the queue. Instead of doing doing uh, the, 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 the the whole uh, process for each packet uh, individually. Yeah. Yeah. So. I don't think you've seen this one with the, the XDP. I also see it's, I want to also, and I call it like it's in two stages, just to, to explain what, what I want. That's not what we have today. <coughs> so this, the first thing is do we take, like we look at the, the, the received descriptors and see if they're ready. That's basically what we do always before it's going on to the next step. But now we'll just take a number of them maybe like eight or something, and we, we start prefetching into lay, to, to, to the L2 cache. And then, then we have the XTP first stage where we actually call the XTP, handing it over the, the what I call the packet page. And 
it, it doesn't do the ac action immediately. Instead, it marks like the vector what, what kind of action it, it, it should do. That minimizes the, the, the whole instruction usage there, and there's basically these four loops going on. And, and then, then the important part here to understand is after this XDP stage, what will be left is all the XDP pass uh, package we have to go to the normal stack. And that means that, that the XDP code that get executed, it doesn't need to be like if there was one package say pass, call the entire stack gets its uh, instruction cache rushed and come back and actually reloads the EBPF program from, 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 from memory. So, so that's the important part. After this stage, there will only be XDP pass packets that need to go to the, to the stage, you know, to, to the packet. We have not allocated the SKB yet, actually. And now we start allocating SKBs and populate and set, up, uh, set it up so we, in sort of the next stage, can, for each packet, call, call the stack. And then there's some more optimizations that someone else proposed. So this is basically contained in the driver. So um, I did an RFC on the E1000 driver that yeah. did this. Um, because I was, A, because I wanted, we wanted to do XDP on E1000, which is maybe a side topic, but also because I was using it to explain some of this stuff to um, one of the developers working on I40E, not these guys here, but somebody else. Um, and then the, the other comment is, we do a memset on the SKB right now, and I'm not entirely sure we need to do that at all. It's, uh, we, we promptly write into all of the fields that are needed by the driver, and I don't think the CB field is, is guaranteed to be coherent across layers. So, and as far as I can tell, it doesn't actually. Yes, we have certain special cases where we guarantee that it, the value will survive layers, but they're few it's, and far between. And it's not coming out of the driver on the receive side. No, 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 so, not that case. It's oh, there's other situations. So this, this in your perf numbers that you're not showing here, but you yeah. showed you showed this mem set as being a huge cost. But I, I, I really don't think it's needed at all, actually. And so, so you're saying we can reduce the mem set? Just, that's, just that's don't do it, and then do a couple. Exists. There's a few fields yeah. that do need to be set, but these, these can just be written to directly. You don't need to do a giant mem set yeah. over the four lines. Yeah. You have thousands of call sites in the kernel using alloc SKB, so maybe one of them is assuming that this SKB CB is cleared. So yeah. you need to audit all the code in the kernel before doing this change. Yeah. Be my guest. Yeah, but we, it's we, totally we, doable, but that's yeah, a lot of work. Can't, can't we just introduce a new function that only the receive? Yeah, Perfect. sure, we can. Have you looked at the size of this function? We yes, already I, have multiple functions, one for the RIGs, uh, transmit, whatever, I, so we can, yes, yeah, like, high cache pressure, sure it's not a matter, so just. Hey, hey Jesper, uh, uh, one thing I'd ask for when, when you're doing all this work is that you think about when you're, you, you think about improving the API for drivers to have a, have a cleaner API that's either, that's both easier, hopefully, to understand and implement to without mistakes, right? So that. Maybe yeah. this API uh, that when you're not just focused on doing the packet pages, right? But that you actually help the drivers by having a packet page receive call, so that we don't have to mess with the SKBs anymore. There's no point in having a driver populate the SKB. There's no point in having the driver call XDP and do a drop. There's no point in doing any of that. Let the drivers handle the descriptor and hand it to you. Yeah. Right. And and that that work that's common to all the device drivers that want to use this subsystem just moves up into into the next layer. Yeah. That's right. And that, that, because that, there's no be really cool. there's no relevance really if if we can if we can build it like a mini structure like a metadata structure that the driver provides that is handed to the SKB builder up above we can provide all the information that our descriptor gave basically abstracting it right. Yeah. Um, into what the SKB could need to be filled out, and then you use it or you don't. We already had all the info. It's almost nothing to fill up that little tiny structure, right? Yeah. Where we're not allocating the full SKB, which you I, talked about the mem set, and I, we just push I, that I, up I into I actually fully agree that, that there would, there's more, more, more to optimize later. That's, that's the point, because I think we'll do this first, and then, then we can push this up. And it's really good. Basically, you're proposing to push up. Don't let the driver allocate the SKB and just push up these. Yeah, but, but, but this way you are adding another overhead of uh, processing the new metadata, metadata um, which uh, will add new um, yeah, the, CPU cycles to the receive path. Yeah, that, that way I would do it, I think, which, which would be actually to allocate the same size as the SKB uh, and pass that up and then reuse that part as an SKB. Yeah. That's a dirty hack. Yeah. yeah, but you will need mem copy or something. Um, 
Yeah, but we already said this information. I think yeah, we, there's definitely more to optimize. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's better to yeah. keep the SKB inside the yeah. device driver. Yeah, uh, so this is basically a little bit in this area that the more controversial is like to deliver a bundle to the network stack because now we're changing the network stack APIs uh, and how that, that, that goes on. And Edward Cree actually proposed some RFC stuff and the performance numbers are really good of avoiding this instruction cache problem of just basically what happens here is that what he did, he didn't do all these steps. He just took down the drive and just avoided calling the stack and just created the SKB list, handled that. I think David has a, has a question. So this reminds me of the, the GRO thing. If you bundle the things with SKBs attached to them, you're actually allocating more SKBs because what GRO does is it attaches, it po it attaches to the end of an existing SKB when the flow matches and then it gets rid of the SKB, which could have been recycled into the next user, the next packet that comes in to the stack. So you'd be losing that. You'd be actually using more SKBs in aggregate than yeah, you would be. That's, but that's, 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 that's why Jesse wants, if we did the, the, your, your proposal, that you just push this thing up, which doesn't have advocated SKBs yet, we can right. actually, it's, it's actually better. Although you could look at it from another way, the resident set size of these, this SKB cluster is like eight at a time or whatever, and that might not hurt a lot. It may actually still be faster to, to do but the that also, with SKBs. That also makes like the programming model much harder, I, I think. No, no, I think it's easier if we can keep all the SKB code I think what, what, what I thought about like just right now was like to basically deal with function pointers so we actually do like, I, I think the basic idea would be to, to always like do processing and just give back a function pointer for the next processing stage and then after that we basically just look which SKB has the same next function pointer and then we execute all those SKBs with the next function, something like that. But I would like to, to do like processing of, an S of one single SKB in one function and not like while right, right loops all the way around that gets really dirty. So, I, so it, um, one more comment. So if you start pushing like a bunch of packets upstream, let, let's for the sake of argument assume it's going to some UDP socket and they're all being dropped. Right, so maybe a good idea to, are uh, you looking at the feedback that comes back or? what the return codes are for each packet you send. So you send 64 packets, one gets through, the other one, is, the buffer is full and you start dropping. Yeah, but it's, it's, is that it's, there's no life big, goes there, on or there's, what? There's, there's not big, no big difference in. Uh, in well, we were sending one packet at a time before and now. Yeah, of course. Now you've made the, uh, what is your quota, like the NAPI? Uh, I would actually only pass eight up, but that's, that's not a So the, the, it may be a good, useful, uh, something to think about is probably use that information that comes back to do something meaningful. Maybe don't send it, the rest of the packets up or schedule something to be restarted afterwards. Or It's also complicated when you have uh, this bunch of packets maybe going through different paths in the code, right? Maybe some are being forwarded, some are going to some TCP socket, some things going to a UDP socket. Yeah. It'd be That's useful if you, the original idea you have there of the RSS maybe shooting packets for a single flow on a single uh, hardware queue. Then it's easier to control. Yeah. I, I, due to time constraints, I want to move on. <laughs> but, uh, so. Like David already talked about XTP. XTP shows up in all presentations. There's also an XTP workshop. You should go to that. But uh, so even though this is not the XTP thing that I'm talking about, about performance, you cannot go without mentioning XTP, right? So so this XTP actually basically started out as a way for me to to benchmark the, the received code path because I wanted to 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 fix that as so there was actually many things to fix. Uh, that's how it started out, and then, then uh, Tom and Alexi came around and said, we can actually uh, do something useful about with this. And, and David just called it the, the next big thing, so that's, that's great. So basically what started as, a, as, a, as just, just a way for me to measure doing this, what I call zoom in benchmarking, to, to, to figure out where, where the pro different performance problem like this. <coughs> so I've, I've been focused on using this to, to to handle the, the driver receive bottlenecks. And I, I, I think I already mentioned it, that that's, that, that the one-to-one, -one, we had 
these numbers and I did a proof of concept and this is great, let's just move on. Uh, so it's, I'm, I'm a little bit evil to say it now because I'm, what, 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 this basically brings motivation for him, for the driver developers, yeah. to actually do this stuff, to fix the, the receive bottlenecks, which is great from my point of view. So one of the important things to realize is that we have to change the memory model to be these writable pages. I think David already mentioned that. Uh, so, but some of the secret to the performance that we're seeing with XDP, which we are all like, well, is that we actually avoid calling the memory layer. That's the whole trick. Uh, we basically, when, you, when, we, when we, we drop packets, it's basically, you cannot do it faster. You, you take the receive ring, you look at the packet, and say, oh, this should be dropped. What, what is a drop, actually? Well, just reinsert it, basically, back into the receive ring. So you're doing one pointer, taking it up, and putting it back. So that's, that's really fast, but you are, we're also cheating ourselves a little bit, right? Because we are not really calling the memory layer. And so the driver implemented these different recycling uh, techniques. And I think we need a more generic solution, especially when you want to transmit out of another, another device driver's uh, uh, exit path. So yeah, I'll talk a little bit about page pool and my proposal. So there's actually a sort of a battle between memory and networking. Uh, and at least for a year, I've been going down that road of provoking uh, bottlenecks in the memory allocator using networking. That's, that's been fun. Uh, so a lot more need, work is needed. So there's sort of two areas. There's allocating the SKP itself, which is the, the KMM cache with the slab allocators. I've saved it's almost done, but I, I want more, more users of this interface. And then there's a page allocator, which I'm currently attacking. I'll have some graphs that shows the baseline performance of the page allocator is just outright wrong. We, we can, this is not fast enough. Um, and this driver recycling is it's nice, but it doesn't, uh, it can get some of the same performance things, but it doesn't address all areas of, of the problem. So, I can't remember when it was, but I discovered that the, this, we had this thing that the network stack was always, always hitting the slow path in the, when we are, we are releasing objects in, 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 the, in the slope allocator. So I went ahead and made the bulking APIs for, for, for slab and sloop. Uh, for, for the slop allocator, uh, it's, it's just a fall through, uh, like a fallback function. But, uh, it's actually upstream, and the network stack uses the, the free side. It's also the most powerful side because we're hitting the slow path there. The allocation side, we, we, we don't use that because we don't know how many incoming is, uh, SKBs or packets are available. Uh, so we would, it's, it's, it's not, not, now that we have these stages and call the pack, like we've discussed a little bit, and, and, and now we can sort of count how many SKBs we need, but in reality we cannot count them anyway because there's this GIO going on. So, so even though I now ha I would have a count to when I send it up to the to the network stack, I could do a bug alloc there, but due to GIO or GSO, uh, I actually have to wait doing this bug alloc. So I also introduced a K-free bug API, which is completely generic. You don't have to tell that what SKP or what slab, slab it came from. Yeah, I'm advocating for more use cases. As you is actually a really good use case. Um, I think we don't have time to discuss all these. Uh, so this is a more interesting slide for, for a lot of people. So if you, we look at the sources of the, the SKP overhead, we have the memory allocation. I'm addressing that with the, the bulking API. So it's almost fixed. And then we, we, as John mentioned, we have the problem of, we have to clear forecast lines. Uh, that's the expensive part. And then we have the problem with the read only receive pages, which caused a more expensive construction of the SKP. And that's what we are trying now to, to, to push with XDP that, that the drivers are not, not going to give us writable pages, which means that we can do a less uh, expensive construction of the SKP. Uh, So this is sort of 
the slide maybe you want to talk a little bit about. So we have different options. So putting the SKP on diet, I think Florian and Westfall worked a bit on that, and that was like quite that was too hard to like reduce the size of the SKB. Like David, David will be really happy every time we remove an element from the so SKB. Do, do you mean really the hard. size or clearing it, right? I mean, the, you're asking about the size. I'm just saying that the, we it's we clear it for convenience in the code. If it's really yeah, yeah, we should look. But but the, 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 these are independent issues. I think making clearing more sane and making the thing smaller to begin with are two separate things. So. Uh, one one thing one area that could that we could uh, investigate is telling CPU vendors that hey, faster clears are really friggin' important. Maybe you could make your CPUs do it even better than you do today. And you know if if it can be done with some constraints, like if it's on an eight byte boundary, then we can do a super fast clear. Then yes, we can guarantee that because that's currently the allocation uh, alignment that's guaranteed by slab and slub. That's not a problem. We could even increase that if we needed to. There's ways to do that. So I think uh, we needed to have a discussion with the CPU crowd to make sure that uh, we tell them that this is a pretty. S I kind of find it weird that B zero isn't isn't a priority <laughs> because this is a pretty fundamental operation that every single piece of the software stack does. But uh, yeah, I still still think there's room for improvement. I'm kind of. How, how are you on, on the delay clearing? Yeah, so th that's what I was about to say. I was like, th this is uh, really hard to to digest. Yeah, if if we just do it on the on the receive the driver receive onto the next layer, could we do that? So you know how, okay. So in for context for everyone else in NetConf, we're discussing how to make uh, net devices uh, smaller. And one of the ideas that came up in that discussion was to have a net device common as an anonymous union, and you could we could therefore support a more lightweight net net device. So maybe we can support a more lightweight SK buff by having an SK buff common. Some smaller object that yeah, some mini SKB overlapping struct. That's what I'm here. Yeah, so like we only initialize the common area when the device receives the packet, and then we do the rest of the stuff as the full identity of the object becomes apparent to the rest of the stack. Yeah, because the the memory case of overhead is the same. It, for, it doesn't really matter how big the object is. Because then that thing is type safe. We know the moment in which the object gets upgraded into a full-fledged SK buffer, and then we know that's the moment in which we have to make sure the rest of the fields are initialized. So that's a clear demarcation point that it can be enforced by the compiler. We, yeah. Don't we kind of do the same trick for sockets where we have like those zero array, array length marks and just clear parts of it always at specific page, um, stages? There's a special... Uh, yeah, we, we already have that. We have that. We have the thing in SK buffer. We say how you have to clear up to this point, and then we explicitly initialize the rest. So we have something similar. Yes. Yeah. So there's a lot of options. No. We can't make the big one bigger. <laughs> so to, people are already trying to take advantage of this change by <laughs> suggesting bigger, more things that <laughs> add. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so this, this is a slide describing why the read-only pages cost more expensive setup. Uh, I don't think we have time to actually explain all this stuff. Uh, actually, one quick thing on this. <clears throat> if you're planning to use Build SKB, it, Build SKB is made more, a bit more expensive in some cases if, uh, you re, if you're using the page because you're going to be writing into a cache cold region for the shared info. Yeah, the shared info, yeah. That's so... Yeah. It's one thing to keep in mind, especially if you're like the nappy GRO frags interfaces reusing SKBs, so you may see a penalty there for drivers that were using that. Yeah, but we, we could we could hide that. We could we could prefetch that area uh, before. I guess we are. Yeah, I think there's like it says it says here there's like 11 minutes left because because they shifted the program 10 minutes, right? Okay, so we still have 10 minutes. So this, this, is, this is just me showing that this is basically uh, my budget for 10 gigabit. And this is the page order if you allocate zero order pages, which I'm ad advocating that the XDP should do. It's the base overhead of, of allocating uh, is higher than my, my, my budget. So that's, that's not good. What the green line shows is what the drivers so, sort of do today. Actually, they do smaller fragments than 4K, but this, this category, I used this slide for the, the memory summit. So. 
<coughs> so that's basically today the drivers look at the curve goes up here, so we are selecting this area here, and, and then we are amortizing by, by partitioning this larger page up in, in, in fragments. We don't have so much time. Yeah, that's the thing I just explained, that we allocate handout fragments, but it's, it's troublesome for, for several reasons, this model, uh, because sometimes it seems like, oh, it's really fast, and then all of a sudden, the page uh, subsystem goes into reclaim or compaction, and then it can stall for, for longer periods of time, and there's a single lock going when you allocate something larger than an older zero page. And Eric points out that clever attackers can, can pin, pin down memory if you allocate these larger order pages. Uh, and it doesn't scale very well on concurrent workloads, which this one shows. Uh, it's because it, there's, a, there's a, a central lock when you allocate something larger order pages in the, in the I said that's, that's actually a lock per NUMA node. Uh, <coughs> but you can see the scaling, this is a really micro benchmark, so it's not that representative, but you can see it goes completely off chart when you order, you have order, order three pages. And I even partitioned this per, per, per divided this uh, to, to be 4K pages, so it goes completely outside my budget. <coughs> so we make the pages writable, there's a lot of details. Um, <coughs> and then what I'm, I'm, I'm proposing to do the, the page pool, and as I've said, like the local re recycling things can fix some of the issues, but I'm trying to fix a larger, or address a larger area. So first, first of all, it's more generic solution that all the drivers could use. And it's faster than the, the page allocator speed because we don't need to, we basically, so basically it can do recycling uh, and don't need to be, a, it could be specialized instead of the page allocator has to check all different kind of issues. So there's no way that the page allocator itself can, can be just as fast as something we can do a specialized allocator. So a trick is to keep the, keep the pages mapped. Uh, to, it helps both the DMA IO MMU mapping, which can be costful in, in some situation. And we also make the pages writable. That's, I didn't explain how, why, why that sort of happens. It's a little bit complicated to explain, but it has something to do with, we have a predictable DMA on map point. Um, it's something Alex uh, taught me. That that's, this is one of the tricks to get, a, get the pages write, writable. Uh, some of the drivers have, have this issue. Uh, I'm also trying to, to say that, that we can also limit, we can input, today we have this problem that we, we only, we just allocate pages from the page pool and, and just hand them off. We, we have no way of knowing when, when the pages are returned back to us. That means we can, as a device driver, as we talked about before, it can eat all the memory and cause out of, out of memory system errors. But as the page pool, we have this sort of feedback loop. The pages have to be returned back to me for the page pool for this, keeping DMA mapping to work. So we could introduce some limitations, saying how many pages a device driver is, is allowed to eat before we say, no, no, you're not getting any more. So we have a sort of protection for the entire system. <coughs> then there's, there's, this, is re this is really a future change, but you could do zero copy, because we know the pages are returned back to us. That's a basic problem. We cannot leak kernel memory, but if, and it's expensive to clear the page before using it. But if I can amortize that cost because the pages are returned back to me, so I could have a mode where I say I want zero copy on this receive queue. And when, when I get pages from the page, I, look at, I have to clear them out, which is an expensive operation. But after that, I know the pages are returned to me. If I know I'm only talking to a specific security domain, I can, I can avoid, uh, I, can, I can do zero copy in, into that. Don't, don't you have a C group for the OOM case? Already? In the drivers or? Put the, I mean, can we do it with the C group? Maybe you could do it with a C group, yeah. We right, only have five minutes. Yeah, the page board is 
sewage pipes. I don't think I have that much more to, you already talked about this one. You have the Q disk. You can just, you have five minutes. <laughs> you watch, what, what did you do in the, the Q disk? Uh, sure, we talked about this earlier, but we're working on removing the Q disk lock. I'm working on it for a while. I think uh, we have uh, some ideas on how to actually get this upstream here in the next short while. There's a RFC two on the V2 or V3 or, or some version on the list from, actually I don't think it was an RFC, I think it was just a regular patch and then it had some issues. Um, on the mailing list, you can dig it up. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, I think, like I said, I think we can get this out in fairly soon, it looks like, uh, by working around some of the corner cases by disabling the lock list and uh, effects in that case. Um, yeah, single queue only. So have a queue per uh, descriptor <coughs> ring in your driver, and that gets rid of most of the corner cases. At least all of the ones I'm aware of that are still uh, still around. So yeah, I thought that was a good solution. We discussed that at NetConf. That yeah, that we we, we, took, we you, you are very very worried about all the corner cases, but we can actually reduce those and say yeah. we do it like that. We did the bulk DQ. We we say that yeah. So then the the next thing is that you right now we do with the latest RFC we do a compare exchange for every DQ. If you turn that into a bulk DQ, you can do one compare exchange for every X number of packets. Um, the probably the simplest, most straightforward thing is to then turn that into a X mint more list. Um, just because you don't have to change any drivers, there's an interesting thing that you could do with the drivers to pull the whole array directly into the into the TX routine and not bother with building this list at all, which uh, requires another driver hook. On the flip side, it's uh, yeah, if, if, it might if, have a, it seems you want have to, a performance benefit by doing if, it. If so. you want to do that, you should sort of HTTP needs the same thing. When we want, we want to have a sure, sure. Transition. That seems good. Um, then you know, once you do this, the next thing is how do we build Q disks like this? Uh, P five O fast is uh, is kind of done in the first series here. Um, we have some ideas to build other Q disks around this for um, Q O S as far as uh, hierarchical token buckets or uh, T B F is pretty straightforward to actually do this with. Um, so you might want to think about building a, a kind of a stacked version of T B F. Um, Taking HTTP directly to be in lockless is quite difficult, and it just because it's the algorithm isn't built for it. So you probably need a new algorithm to do that. Um, I was toying with fair queuing, so maybe we'll get something for fair queuing, and uh, I think those are the big points here. Um, the, the nice thing about this, if you get this all lined up correctly, uh, the package and numbers that you like to show where you yeah. attach directly onto the driver, you can get the same numbers, but when you move up a layer into the queue disk, and so. It's, yeah, it's quite I, nice. I think it's a really great work out. So, so stay tuned. Finally did something. Hopefully we finally get those in. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's much more. And as you already talked about your your soft IQ and threaded nappy, right? Yeah, so, uh, as I was told by Eric, he has some concerns that uh, there could be like starving situations. So it's still of a, we still have to look and find bugs and investigate more on this. Yeah, so so we have to fix soft IQ first, like making sure that we, 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 we push out those bugs that... Or make sure that we measure the correct things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's also, there's a lot of different combinations you can measure. Like, we identified the live log and Eric fixed it. And after talking to him, I actually worried that we might still have issues with, with that, how we fixed it. Um, so, so there there's still might still be box hiding in in software IQ and how to be intact with the scheduler and and there was there was a quite bad performance hit if you have a like UDP socket receiving and you actually run this UDP receiver on the same CPU which we sort of recommend people do <laughs> there was like the performance dropped to like a thousand packets per second and with Eric Fix we are like nine hundred thousand packets per second. But if you move it to another CPU, you can do, in my tests, 1.6 million. Uh, but we, and we, we're still dropping packets on the, on, on we run this, the, the application on the same CPU as the receiver in, in, in the UDP is sort of overload case. Um, and that's... Yeah, there are, there are kind of fairness issues if, if 
uh, a socket from one CPU basically overwrites a socket from another CPU and, and it's like too much time on, on another, another CPU, it could get up in, in like fairness issues. So um, we m probably need to have more feedback loops to, to block NAP earlier for like foreign threats maybe. We don't know yet, that's, that's still like very early investigations. Yeah, after, after I, I, I saw this problem and Eric's, after Eric's fix, I can actually understand that people are complaining about that simple UDP floods can kill the whole traffic because nothing actually reached the application. Everything was dropped uh, because the software you used too much time. Yeah, but also the, the, um, the removal of the backlog actually helps in here too. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the work you're doing together with Paolo to, to, to fix this area because it was worse than I expected. So I'm out of time. Yeah, Pablo.